from HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 231, recorded live Thursday, September 2nd, 2010. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Eric Sink from SourceGear about DVCS. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. And today we're chatting with Eric Sink, a founder at SourceGear, who makes source control products. Um, and I wanted to talk to Eric because I figured he could explain distributed revision control or DVCS, distributed version control systems, to me. How's it going, Eric? Good morning, Scott. Going well. How are you? Not too bad. Um, I I started uh, using version control systems in, I want to say, 91 or 92. Wow. That is like 20 years ago, almost. And uh, I use, my first one, my introduction to that was... Uh, was source safe. And I spent a lot of time in source safe. Do you think people are still using it now? Oh, definitely. Um, we, uh, we hear a lot of people uh, using source safe. In fact, you know, we still sell an add on product for source safe. Um, and it still sells fairly well after 10 years. So, uh, there's definitely a lot of source safe users out there. And what is it that people hate about source safe and why do so many people use it? Um, well, I mean, what they hate about SourceSafe is just its reputation. Um, you know, I, we've done our share of bashing SourceSafe, I'd have to say, but, you know, the fairest way to say it is that, um, SourceSafe probably doesn't deserve as much bashing as it gets. It, it had, uh, some reliability problems in the past. My understanding is those are mostly worked out. Um, and so, you know, what we need to talk about is what they love about SourceSafe, and that is what they loved back in 92, and that is it's really easy to use. And uh, people are still in love with that kind of ease of use. It seems like some people have said that SourceSafe is really no more useful than just zipping up your source. Like, I know a lot of people, unfortunately, who still do that. Like, source control to them is a zip file, like 1.zip, 2.zip. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. I mean, we've all done that. <laughs> Um, I don't, I mean, I think to say that source safe is no more useful than that is, uh, is pretty unfair. Um, okay. I mean, I think it's fair to say that source safe has not, um, stayed modern as version control has evolved over the years, mm -hmm. but it was a groundbreaking product when it was released. Um, and the fact that it is still widely used almost 20 years later uh, is really a testament to what a great product it has been. Seriously? Really? I do. I, yeah, I do. You don't think it's just because it's I sticky? I that. mean, that people are just using it because of momentum and inertia? Well, I think, uh, it's I mean, free? I think it's free. I mean, it, basically, <laughs> um, it's very Windows friendly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it still has a lot going for it, even though, you know, I don't think you're going to see a lot of your so called alpha hackers using source save these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a lot of programmers out there, all kinds and shapes and sizes, and mm -hmm. um, SourceSafe is um, SourceSafe is still pretty popular. Do we want to get those other those those people off of this? Um, I I know Microsoft does, um, and I know to an well, extent but yeah, we but, do. But, but Microsoft aside, do we as 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 programmers that are slightly above average? want to help the average and below average programmers get off of this thing is it a is it a bad thing or is it better than nothing i i don't see some think, people would say it's worse than nothing but that may just be bashing i think it's just i think it's just bashing mm -hmm. um i mean if you're a modern source safe user using the latest releases I don't think it's that bad of a tool. I certainly don't oh, think it's goodness. something, you know, that we have to rescue them. Although this is totally I not mean, the way I thought this was going to go. <laughs> well, the fact <laughs> is, I mean, I answer, I give the opposite answer sometimes because I have a business incentive, um, to sell people our source safe replacement. And I, I like to sell that. That's great. But the, um, the fact is every time we go to a trade show, somebody comes up to us and asks us, so why should I get off source safe? And I ask them the question, are you happy with source safe? And they say, yes, I am. I said, then don't get off. Oh, I mean, yeah. we, we, but isn't it not we have this conversation anymore? over and over. 
Now, the vast majority of people, it turns out, are not happy with SourceSafe. And for those people, we have a solution we hope fits them. But um, we're not trying to force people into a change that they don't have any reason to make. Hmm. That's extremely, that's extremely pragmatic. Wouldn't, wouldn't, couldn't you argue that by switching over to, to something like Subversion, uh, which wouldn't be too big of a jump, that um, they, they would gain so much more and they would have a product that was changing uh, and, and being improved on a regular basis? I could definitely argue that, but I mean, there's a couple things to that I always keep in mind. One is that psychologists will tell you that people don't change unless the status quo becomes intolerable, and I think that's in, that's even more true for version control users. People are just really resistant to change their version control tool, and we're not likely to succeed in business if our bu- if our business model is to convince people that they're unhappy. I mean, salespeople will have this thing they call create dissatisfaction with the status quo. I'm not a sales weasel. Um, you know, I'm primarily just trying to be pragmatic, like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, there are enough unhappy people for us to make money. There's no reason trying to take happy people and turn them into unhappy people just so that we can make money. Hmm. Okay. But what about kind of the larger philosophical stuff like the, you know, save their souls? Are their souls in danger? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know if I'd say their souls in danger. They're, um, you know, the the fact is there are better alternatives out there, and mm-hmm. um, you know sometimes people are happy because they don't know what they're missing. Um, and there's, you know, there is another side to this coin, and that is that you show people what they're missing, and all of a sudden they start to become unhappy, and they think about a change. And there's some. There are some tools out there that are a major step forward. I mean, SourceSafe is largely what it is in 93. You know, this thing has not changed a lot, certainly in the last 15 years. And uh, the fact that it still meets anyone's needs is amazing. How many pieces of software do you know that are 15 years old? But that doesn't mean it's modern. That doesn't mean it has kept pace. And, and certainly there are alternatives out there that people um, should explore if they're interested in new things. Okay. So, so one of the things that people, that I didn't like and people don't like about source, uh, source safe out of the box is the idea that when I check something out, it's checked out only to me, exclusive checkouts. And while right. there are settings within source safe to say that you don't really want to lock a file when you check it out, most people don't change that. And when they do, the merging and process is so painful that they get in trouble. Uh, and I have been at two different companies where we have moved from source safe to either CVS uh, or Subversion and uh, found Subversion to be absolutely lovely and wonderful and the uh, Tortoise uh, SVN is great. Uh, And everything was peachy keen until we actually did merges. And then things got a little crazy. And then we tried to go and impose a, uh, you know, the whole standard trunks and branches style of a folder uh, layout. And then things got a little bit better. Can, could you talk a little bit about some of the strengths of CVS and Subversion and and how that is or is not an improvement over SourceSafe? Well, I mean, certainly you've hit some of them there already. Um, Subversion is a heck of a tool. Um, it, uh, the the truth, despite everything we just said, is that SourceSafe users are leaving SourceSafe at a regular basis, and um, a lot of them are going to our product, a lot of them are going to TFS, but a whole lot of them are going to Subversion, and for good reason, because... It's free. It's constantly being maintained and improved. It's reliable. Um, and once they, once they kind of get over the, the lack of exclusive locks on a file, um, it, everyone who makes that choice, who makes that change, um, is happier when they're done. There's a certain fear to it, um, for people who have always sort of, lived with the assumption that when I have a file checked out, I'm the only one that can modify it. And there's a safety in that, that it's hard to get people out of. But once they do make the change, everyone I know who's made the change um, is happy once they've done it. Um, but even the ones that dreaded the change before they did it. And the CVS versus Subversion, I mean, uh, it, CVS was what we we switched over to at the time. And then kind of Subversion was, was on the rise. And then we, we actually went from we switched from source safe to CVS and then said, well, you know, things are getting corrupted and things are difficult and things are tricky and we'll just switch over to subversion. So we kind of did like a little hop 
between the two. It, that seems to be a very common thing. But now CVS is largely forgotten. Yeah, it, less and less common all the time. I mean, there's very little reason to start using CVS today. If you um, if you're looking for a new version control in that realm, then Subversion is is almost certainly the way to go. I talked to uh, I talked to some folks once at a at a bank who you know I I like to ask people what source control tool they use, and they said, "Well, we we'll use CVS." And I said, "Good grief! Why don't you switch to Subversion? I mean, it's time." And and they said, well, we're not allowed to switch to Subversion because um, there's a policy against open source. And I said, you know, CVS is open source. And they said, yes, but our bosses don't know that. <laughs> so <laughs> aside from the crazy reasons, there's really no reason to use CVS today. Subversion's outstanding. <laughs> I, I have worked at that company, whatever that is. Uh, yeah, we've <laughs> snuck open, I've snuck open source into companies <laughs> because it was well known and they knew the name. So they assumed there was a company behind it. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. So then, what is distributed version control? So, uh, distributed version control is is this new, relatively new thing. Um, and you know, saying that it's uh, saying that it's new, I suppose, is uh, a little bit insulting to the folks that have been doing it since 1997. But the fact is, um, it's uh, it's relatively new because it's you know it's only recently starting to approach mainstream. And the basic idea is that instead of one central server, um, the version control tool um, in most cases will operate um, where every user has their own copy of the whole repository. Um, the, the sort of high level way of explaining it is that it brings a tremendous amount of flexibility and, um, by and large, the DVCS community has has done a horrible job of explaining its benefits because usually when you ask somebody what a DVCS is, they will say something like, oh, well, there's no central server. Well, who wants that? I mean, everyone wants a central server. In fact, the, uh, the reality is that the, one of the big benefits of DVCS is that instead of one central server, you might want two or three for all kinds mm-hmm. of reasons because of the flexibility. The other thing that people say is that you can code on an airplane. And no one codes on airplanes. You know, yeah, the code on an airplane always seemed that was, that, that was exactly what people said. We didn't code on an airplane. That's, isn't that great? You, don't you want to do all of your good work on an airplane and then check it in from the lounge? Yeah, I mean, the, the idea is sort of ludicrous. And it, as I, you know, one of the jokes I throw around is that, well, the airplanes have Wi Fi now anyway. So, um, but the, uh, uh, really it just comes down to flexibility. And after, 10 years of supporting different source control products, one thing I know is that customers always want flexibility. They always end up wanting some kind of flexibility that you don't have. And so, you know, if we if we go to most of our customers today and say, hey, um, we're going to offer you a product that has no central server, they're going to freak out. But some of those same customers have called us and said things like, uh, yeah, so I've got this team in Phoenix and I got a team in Denver and I don't want to have to use the same server for both of them. I wanted each of them to have their own server and sync it up at night. Can I do that? You know, and that's the kind of things that DVCS does because of the flexibility, but, um, it, it, it needs to be explained in terms of the kinds of problems that customers really have. This is the part of the show where I mock you. Well, actually, Telerik mocks us. Your applications that you're testing dependent on external systems over which you have no control. Maybe you're being slowed down by those systems, their lack of availability, responsiveness. You want to do TDD right? Our friends at Telerik help you solve some of those problems with their newest mocking tool, Just Mock. It'll let you do fast, simple, controlled unit tests independent of external resources like databases, web services, proprietary code. Unlike some mocking tools, Just Mock works with non virtual methods, sealed classes, Static methods, giving you complete control of your code. You can get more details. You can download Just Mock at Telerik.com slash Just Mock. And don't forget to thank Telerik for supporting Hansel Minutes on their Facebook fan page, Facebook.com slash Telerik. Thanks a lot. So what is the balance then between having a central server and still being distributed? Um, the balance, um, is usually, I mean, in terms of a DVCS, um, it's, it's your central server is the central server because of policy. You're not in contact with it all the time, 
But every team I know that uses a DVCS has at least one central server. And the, I guess I'd say the balance is that you have the central server for the things you want it for, but you don't have to have it every second. You do have the ability to have offline operation, um, which, you know, is still important even if you're not talking about airplanes because, I mean, the fact is people are mobile these days and, you know, and for a lot of people, I know certainly for me, Wi-Fi is a lot like a cop. I mean, it seems like there's always a cop around when you don't need one. And, uh, and when you do, you can't find one. Well, Wi-Fi is the same way. Everywhere I go, there's signs saying free Wi-Fi. And about a third of the time, when I really need Wi-Fi, I don't have it. And so, I mean, offline operation is still, is still a valuable use case. Uh, but that doesn't mean we don't, we don't want a central server. I mean, we all want a place where the team pushes their work. And, uh, and so everyone I know uses a DVCS that way. And in fact, some of them have two central servers. They'll have, okay, push your work to here if it's, if it passes the test suite. And then they'll have mm-hmm. another central server that says, push it here if it doesn't pass the test suite, but, but you want it backed up. So we got two central places to put it. Okay. But, but the, the main, like the lead in the, in the chief programmer model, their computer is never the authoritative source, is it? It's the central um, server. That's right. It's you, their computer is not the authoritative source. It's a, it's a copy of the of the repo that uh, is only as up to date as you know as it is synchronized with the central server. Right, right. But it would be fair to say, like with like, like Linus's computer is not the authoritative source of the kernel. Some central repository is. That's probably true. I don't actually know how Linus does that. Um, well, you know, he uses but, Git, of course, and he but he's the kind of the primary committer, so. People right. send him requests, pull requests, and say, "Here's a here's a fix. Go check sure. it out." Right. The real answer is that um, the thing that is the central is the authoritative source is the one you decided you want it to be, rather than having the software constrain you and say all your changes have to be here for them to be authoritative. Um, it's simply a matter of you decide whether you. Just making the decision or having the software make the decision is the way to say it. Say that again. Uh, yeah, because I didn't say it well. No, but um, that's it's 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 either incredibly deep or it makes no sense at all. So I want you to say it again so I can find out which it is. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, the difference is whether the software is making a decision about where what the authoritative repo for the code is or whether a human being is making the decision. Right, right. And no matter what the software says, you can just decide that the authoritative source is your machine if you'd like. And and that's where you, you know, God forbid, that's where you do your builds and your releases from, then I guess it is the authoritative source. Right. And if you want to decide it that way, you're free to. Um, the... I mean, this is a little bit of a two-edged sword. I go back to what I started with here and say that um, the great thing about DVCSs is our flexibility. And the bad thing about flexibility is that it allows people to do stupid things. It's a little bit like C. You know, um, C can do anything, but it's also one of the best languages for shooting yourself in the foot. We have the same design pattern all across technology. Things that offer more flexibility give the user the power to do stupid things. People, you know, things that have really constrained user interfaces, like an iPod, you don't have a lot of power to do stupid things, but they work really, really well. (laughs) Why do people initially find it so difficult to jump from something like Subversion or SourceSafe or even SourceGear to a distributed version control system? What is the, 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 the disconnect that makes that leap difficult? Um, I certainly think the, I mean, one of the first disconnects is, is a little bit what we've been talking about where, um, they don't see why they still want their central server and the tool is being explained to them in a way that says they don't need one. You know, that's one of the first disconnects. Um, the, uh, it's also, um, the flexibility comes at a little bit of a price. So another big disconnect is this idea that branching, you're either afraid of it or you're not. Source control tools that do a lousy job at branching and merging train people to be afraid of branching and merging. The fact mm. is that DVCS tools 
branching and merging is extremely common. So the tools end up being really good at it. Yes. And that disconnect can be a big issue as well. Now that's, that's significant. There are things that may or may not be possible in the core engine of a source control system, but depending on the way that they are presented through the tooling, you can basically make people afraid of the concept by the tool sucking enough. And I definitely can say I was a branching and merging Per, I was I was afraid of those those concepts, and people who are saying yes in the DVCS world, it is just so it's wonderful. It's just you know it's puppies and unicorns. Uh, it's difficult to believe that. So I would say even my my own kind of disbelief that it could be that easy is uh, is enough to prevent me from leaping over that chasm. And to an extent, you're right. Uh, um, everyone saying that it's you know it's just wonderful joy doing branching and merging. Um, in the DVCS world, I think they're overstating it a bit. Um, okay. It's better. It's definitely better. But you don't want it, to – it's still something to be avoided. <laughs> I mean, I just did um, – yeah, I'm working as a programmer on our team, and I had a, uh, a five-week private branch where I was actively coding for five weeks, and the rest of the team was actively coding for five weeks, and I had to do a merge. Mm. And it, it worked out pretty well, but it still wasn't fun. I mean, merging – you know, merging can be a pain, and DVCSs make it better, but they're they're not a panacea for that. What are some of the DVCSs that people would would look at? I mean, I think we know some of the source control systems that are more more standard, more centralized version control systems. We, we hear about Git, we hear about Mercurial. Uh, you have you have a product as well. Yeah, we are we are working on a new offering. Um, certainly, uh, ours is not ready yet, but. Um, Certainly, the two most popular ones today would be uh, would be Git and Mercurial. And um, for a little bit more Windows friendly audience like uh, like this one, you know, Mercurial uh, is probably the most popular choice. Um, and, and it's it's outstanding. We used Mercurial for our own development until we could dog food, which means you know we were using it for quite a while and and mm-hmm. uh, finding it to be a good product. Why is Mercurial? For, people keep saying Mercurial is more friendly. Uh, why is that? It's just because it integrates with, there's an integration point for Explorer? Um, well, it, there, it's that, but the, I mean, the same thing exists to some extent for Git. Um, Mercurial was definitely designed for ease of use. Um, I mean, there, I, I guess I'd give two answers. One is the, the ease of use aspect. And the big issue there is that Git has one extra abstraction that it calls the index. Um, so it's not only an extra abstraction, but it's a poorly named abstraction. And that is that um, everything in Git goes into this staging area and then it gets committed. And so it's it's actually sort of an extra step. And conceptually, it's just one more abstraction for people to wrap their head around. And the... Uh, and the result is that it, it creates the impression of being a little harder to use. Um, Mercurial doesn't have that. Its command set is much more similar to Subversion, um, except for the fact that it's a DVCS, of course. And uh, most people just find it to be a lot friendlier. Uh, the second big thing, especially for Windows users, is that Git was originally written only for Linux. Um, it's uh, it's suffered um, from a little bit of... Um, you know, Linux centricity ever since. Um, it's never, it's nowhere close to as cool and fast on Windows as it is on Linux. Whereas Mercurial is, is much more pr- cross platform in that regard. Why should someone pick one? I mean, uh, should you just try them both and see what you like? Or should you, um, should you simply make the decision based on Mercurial slightly more friendly on Windows? Um, like what kind of it's, things should you think about when you are out there thinking it's time for us to 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 move towards distributed version control? What are some of the the decision points? Probably, um, well, like I said, Windows friendliness is is one decision point. I mean, people come in two kinds when they're making decisions like that. They either trust the advice of an expert or they want to go explore every single issue and decide what to do. You know, I'm currently looking to buy a new truck and I explored every single issue. I don't want to just tell, have somebody tell me, get a Ford or a Chevy. Okay. And, uh, you know, the same thing happens. Um, if you want to trust the advice of an expert, yeah, would, I'd say go with Mercurial, try it first. Um, but if you want to explore every single issue, you'll find out that, you know, some of the decision points are, 
Um, if you work primarily on Windows, Git is going to frustrate you. Um, if you are interested in the absolute fastest product, Git is the way to go. Uh, Mercurial is pretty fast. Even on but, Windows? Um, Isn't it, it depends I, on the version of I, Git you're using. I would say on Windows, they're going to be competitive. Um, okay. Certainly, if you're on if you're on Linux and performance is, is you know primary for you, you know Git is the way to go. Um, you know you should know whether you're a power user or not. I mean, Git has hundreds of commands. It's like a Swiss Army knife. It lets you do anything you want to do. Uh, Mercurial is is relatively simple in that regard. Um, oh, another big one is. Um, and I don't know if this is too far, too much detail for the show, but um, Git and Mercurial have different detail. philosophies about pushing change sets to the server. Um, Git will let you do things that could be thought of as rewriting history. Um, what you know, what Linus wants his lieutenants to do when they push things to his repo is, don't show me all the intervening changes that you made. What I want you to do is take all your changes, squash them up into one change set with one good explanatory comment, and push me that. It's simpler. I want things clean. Well, in a sense, if you only push that to the central repo, you lost all your intervening steps, and those steps are, in fact, part of the history of the change. And so there's this huge philosophical divide between the the culture of the Git community and the culture of the Mercurial community. And if you dive in to look for decision points, you will find that divide and you will find yourself siding with one side or the other. <laughs> Is it a war? Um, I don't know if I'd say it's a war. Um, <laughs> a little bit, maybe. I haven't seen any actual blood, but it's it's definitely a disagreement. <laughs> Um, do you think that Windows people focus too much on wishing there was a tortoise version of whatever the version control system that they wanted? Um, do they tortoise, focus of course, too for much those on who are it? Listening, is a, is a, as a plug in to explore, uh, tortoise CVS was one, tortoise SVN. It lets you, you know, right click on a folder and check out and right click and do all of your source control management system either, you know, inside of Explorer. And there seems to be basically three kinds of people. There's command line people. There's inside Visual Studio people, and then there's Explorer people. And whenever I hear someone talk about Git or Mercurial on a Windows side, I hear them say, yeah, I'll wait for the really awesome Tortoise version of that that thing. I I don't know if I'd say they focus too much on it, but I, do, I can say that I'm not sure I get it. I always thought of people who prefer the Tortoise client, I always wondered, are these just refugees who found something they can use because there was no good visual studio client. I mean, cause I mean, certainly in our, in our business, it's all about the visual studio client. We don't have any command line users. I don't know, maybe one. Um, <laughs> and it's all about visual studio. And for a long time, I know that CVS and subversion and tools like that didn't really have great visual studio integration, but then this thing popped up that's, you know, everyone called tortoise. And I'm like, you know, I just never quite figured out, do people actually prefer the Tortoise client or is it that they they couldn't get Visual Studio so they settled for this and then they fell in love with it? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, you know, you never know I, why, why people pick one thing and then once they've picked that thing, that's how they work. Therefore, that's that's what they're, that's what they're going to do. I, mean, I know that I, I'm using Mercurial now and as a long time, uh, as a Subversion user, I find it more comfortable just because Tortoise HG, which is the Mercurial plugin for Explorer, feels 80% like what I'm used to. But the the hardcore alpha types say, you know, I should grow a pair and I should learn how to use the command line and gets the way to go. <laughs> well, those don't necessarily have to be synonymous. So using Mercurial from the command line is actually kind of nice. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, there's right. always going to be somebody telling you that you should use what they like instead of what you like. It's the way technology works. What, what is uh, what's you, you have an open source pr- project that you're working on? You mentioned a little bit before. What what are you doing in the distributed version control space? We're uh, we're implementing something we call Veracity, and as you said, it's open source, and the the core will stay open source. Although we do plan on selling some uh, some add-ons that are proprietary later. Um, but you know, in a nutshell. We're, we're looking down the road and thinking that, uh, the DVCS model is likely to be the future of this industry. Um, 
so we're you know we're we're making a long term play here and saying we're trying to build something that has some of the best benefits of something like mercurial but is designed um to be very uh enterprise friendly um designed to be a, a bit more um a bit more adaptable to the kinds of things that uh that a lot of paying customers are going to care a lot about um you know things like administration features uh ID integration of course is going to be is going to be a focus for us um you know the i think the current tools have gained this uh, huge popular following in the community and i think they deserve it um but what we're hearing from from a lot of corporate and enterprise customers when they try and switch to something like mercurial or or git they stumble um because they uh, over things like you know wait let me get this straight there's no logins there's no there's no way to administer users you know things like that um so we're we're uh we're trying to build something uh that uh that follows in the footsteps of some of these outstanding tools but also uh is looking towards more corporate users later uh, that'll be very interesting to hear from people who are listening uh when they respond in the comments to see if you're you know you're effectively saying we're going to make an enterprise friendly dvcs and there's the implicit the ones that are out there really aren't enterprise friendly or you know scalable to the, to the to the the size that a company has and i don't mean scalable just like in the how many people can use it but uh in the kinds of things that you throw at it that it would be more unusual versus the kind of classic way that open source is developed um, that sounds like a pretty interesting business opportunity. Well, we think it is. Um, it's ambitious for a company our size, but we're excited about it, and we're we're doing well so far. So it's fun. It's a it's a fun ride. Very cool. Well, thanks so much for sitting down with me and talking about uh, distributed version control systems. And hopefully, folks will go out there and uh, start downloading stuff. And uh, and apparently, not asking an expert, they're going to go figure it out themselves. <laughs> In most cases, I, I dare say they will. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes. We'll see you again next week. Mm-hmm.